and I actually was walking down the street. It was Halloween night, beautiful October evening in the Midwest, and I looked up. And as I looked up, I saw the sky was just full of demons and just black leathery things with red eyes and their eyes just stared into me. And I could feel something unclean hit my soul at that moment. And I believe at that moment, my soul was defiled by the demonic spirits that surround Halloween. Hello, my friends. So this is the second part of my response to Bill Schnobelin on, on the occult origins of Halloween. And the link to my the first episode is right here. I suggest you watch that first before you watch this one. It'll help to clarify some things. Basically, in the last episode, Bill was talking about how on Halloween night when he was 10 years old, he went out trick-or-treating and saw a bunch of swirling leathery creatures with red eyes staring at him and he was defiled his words by them and now we're coming to the point where he says that at this point is when he became interested in, in the occult where i happen to think that if such an event actually did happen to me i would be the most devout Christian you had ever seen in your entire life. I would be so far away from the occult, it would not be funny. Because if demons actually do exist, I would not want to be anywhere near them. So, let's hear the rest of Bill's wonderful fictional story. And, you know, after that, I can look at my life, even as a young child, that I gradually began to be interested in the occult and, you know, various weird things. And by the time, of course, I was in college, I'd become a witch. Bill also claims to have been a witch. And from the research that I have done, first of all, there's all kinds of conflicts. He says that he was initiated into Alexandrian Wicca. And he says he was part of the Church of Frost. He says that he was initiated into a group in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm not too sure where he actually studied Wicca. But wherever and whoever taught him Wicca, he was either completely not listening to anything they had to say, or basically he just went through the motions of studying it all for the sole purpose of one day disparaging it, which he is doing now. Because there are a lot of people who get into Wicca, maybe even fall out of Wicca, but they don't go around telling stories and making up lies about it. They just find out it wasn't for them, and they move on with their life. They don't make a big deal out of it. They don't go on to YouTube and make huge videos. Well, actually, some people do, but those people, they have another agenda rather than finding out and actually searching and finding out what actually speaks to them. They would much rather spend their energy on time basically trying to make Wicca look bad and disparage them, such as our friend Bill here. So I think that the danger to children, especially because children are, are more, more vulnerable, but even to adults, it's a dangerous time. Dangerous in what aspect, Bill? How is it dangerous? And we really encourage parents to pray over their children during this season, to not let their children run around alone, uh, and to not let them go trick-or-treat, you know, but rather have some kind of fun that you can do as a family. Exactly. Now, a um, little in uh, the history here of Halloween. Now, where does the bonfire come from? I know it's uh, represented as the bone fire. You want to describe that a little bit? Well, again, in the British Isles and in probably Northern Europe as well, there was this custom of lighting. They were originally called Baal fires, and it related to Baal, who's, of course, a false god. We see Baal even in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And No, Bill. This, this is just basic concept of the English language. Baal, B-A-L-E, 
is like a bale of cotton or bale of hay, which was a bale that they lit on fire and it became a bale fire. You are talking about a Sumerian or Syrian, you are talking about a Middle Eastern god called Baal, B-A apostrophe A-L. Baal, the deity, and the word Baal have several thousands of miles between the two. One is a Baal, the other one is a god. One is in a Sumerian religion, Sumerian language, and is about 1,000, 2,000, possibly even 2,500 years before the time of the word Baal, at least 1,000 words. Uh, excuse me, at least 1,000 years. Uh, they would they would use these as a way of trying to keep the sun god from dying, like we were talking earlier about blood sacrifice. And No, Bill. The idea of a bale fire back in the time of the Celts when they came to Britain is probably sort of like a signal flare, a way, a way of communicating. At least in one story, it happens to be the way of marking when Beltane began because they would see the flame, they would see the fire on the hill of Tara, and from that point, they would light their own fire. And it was kind of, it was a way of marking the beginning of something because your information is, is, is incredibly wrong. You're right, later on they became known as bone fires and then over the, the years got cleaned up to bonfires because- No, snuffle up, I guess. They did not, bale fire and bone fire are two completely different root words. Bale fire, here's the origin of bale fire, and this is the origin of bone fire or bonfire, which may mean good fire or not, or from the bone fire. But that comes from the 15th century. Bale fire is much earlier than that. So again, bale and bale, two separate words. Bale fire, bone fire, two separate words. I don't know where you're getting all of your information, Mr. Snuffleupagus. But again, it is a big stinking pile of wrong. You know, they, they would throw animals into it. They might even throw babies into it in some cultures. Bill, I don't know where you're getting this information, what book you read or where you read that they were throwing babies into bale fires or bonfires at any point in history. Uh, it, was a, it was not a good thing. And, you know, because again, this is all about sympathetic magic, about, about sending forth the lives of innocent beings so that this God, this supposed God, who of course is ultimately really Satan, can live. Okay, skinny Santa Claus, you don't even understand the concept of sympathetic magic. Sympathetic, sympathy, having commonality between these two things. Sympathetic magic is the idea that if you do one thing by sympathetic influence, it will cause something else to happen. So if somebody, hypothetically, was trying to perform sympathetic magic by throwing a baby into a fire, how, what would be the sympathy of that, that somewhere else somebody will be throwing another baby into a fire. Your whole premise, again, is a stinking pile of crap. And also, uh, trick or treat, uh, do you want to describe the origins of that, what that really means? Well, of course, it's not obviously been cleaned up today, but, but back in the ancient times, the idea was is that the, these, these satanic priests would go into a village and they would say, we'd, they'd go up to a house at random in that village, and they would, you know, put a mark on the, on the door and say, you have to give us your youngest child or we'll destroy your house. And then we're going to take that child and sacrifice it to the dark god Saman, who's the god of Samhain. Saman is not the dark god of Halloween. I don't even know where you're getting this. Again, you don't give any citation, you don't give any information whatsoever. There is no Celtic or Gallic god called Saman, who is the god of Samhain. 
And I, again, I do not know where you're getting this information about the satanic priests. And I don't even know what time period you're talking about. There would, first of all, have to be the establishment of Christianity. It would have to go on for at least another 600 years for there even to be the concept of Satan. And then you might have the idea of Satanists. But again, I don't believe that that actually came into even a concept until later on, maybe 15th 16th century? I don't even know when the idea of Satanists began. But you were talking about a period of Roman Britain when the Celts were there. And this time period is at least 100 years before. So I don't know where you're getting this concept that there were Satanic priests putting marks on people's doors. I don't know where you're getting this from, Bill, but again, you are wrong. The God of death. And, uh, and of course, if the parents refused, then they would destroy the household. They'd burn the house to the ground. And, and today, of course, it's more benign. And then the kids go and say, give us candy or we'll soap your windows or teepee your trees or something like that. But, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. And again, you're, you're, you're playing around with diabolical things and you're playing around with things that are rooted in human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, and child sacrifice. And uh, the pumpkins now, I know that it wasn't originally pumpkins, it was yams you said, but um, you want to explain the jack-o'-lantern, how they basically took human flesh as wax and filled well it? Yeah, they, they actually would take, you know, the, some of the, the remains of these poor, unfortunate children, and they would make candles out of them, and they'd put these inside of either skulls or inside of large gourds. Or... Ah! Bill, you are, you are a sick and twisted individual. I, I went to the National Candle Association website. I did research on this. There is the concept uh, that human fat could be used to make soap and it could be used to make candles, but there is no recorded history of any human fat or baby fat being used to make candles. It's not a very good burning source. And candles were made for pa from paraffin, beeswax, from tallow. Tallow is made from vegetable or, or, uh, or animal fat. But there is no history, there is no record of Celts or Druids or anybody in the British Isles using human fat to make a candle. So I don't know what region of your twisted and sick, perverted mind this is coming from, but there's no record of it. Something of that nature. And uh, they would believe that if they pointed this grinning face outward, it would be a sign to the demons to leave this house alone. So it was kind of like a talisman to ward off evil. No, Bill. Again, you are wrong. Very, very, very wrong. The history of the Jack O'Lantern comes from an Irish legend of Stingy Jack. Stingy Jack tricked the devil a couple of times, and the final time that the that Jack tricked the devil, he made a he made a promise with the devil that Jack would never go to hell. So Stingy Jack kind of lived a life that was, well, not exactly a Christian life. And so when he died, God would not let him into heaven and he couldn't go into hell. And so Satan put a lump of coal from hell into a gourd and Stingy Jack had to walk around for the rest of his life carrying this lantern with him. And this legend is where we get the legend of a Jack O lantern and where people would put candles into gourds. They would put it into hollowed out potatoes, hollowed out beets in England especially, and also hollowed out um, turnips. So again, this whole legend came 
after Christianity was established in Ireland. But of course, the problem is, is again, you know, there's this very ancient, if you will, cult about the severed head, which is present all over the Northern Europe, all over the British Isles, uh, and, and how it somehow relates to, well, in the British Isles, it relates to Bran, the blessed he's called. Yes, there was a, probably a couple of Celtic tribes that did go around do headhunting. However, by the time that the Celts came into England at the time, this cult of the severed head was probably more of a legend and probably died out because this was not a very, it was not a, it was not a practice that really caught on and suddenly everybody was doing it. It was something that was beginning to die out, especially as Rome came, came over and started to, uh, put tribes against each other and various tribes stopped fighting and started uniting against the Roman Empire. But this cult of the severed head, which probably did exist, began to die out, especially by the time it came to England. So yes, Bill, you are partially correct. However, it was not a very widely practiced practice. But in other countries, it relates to other other various beings, uh, gods, demons, whatever. And it, it's all very evil. It's, it's you know, I mean, would you want to have a thing burning on your doorstep that was made out of, you know, uh, human human baby fat or something of that nature? This yeah, is... no, and the... Yes, Bill, that would be awful and disgusting. And I don't think anybody would want that if it actually happened. People do this stuff. all the time. And how many pumpkins are sold uh, in the, just in the United States alone? Millions. And um, also, when they uh, gave them the pumpkin, is that when they, uh, just like you went to a household, they offered the sacrifice? Is that when they put the pumpkin at you, though? Yeah. Well, that was a sign that that house was okay then, that it had been, they'd offered up their tithe to hell, so to speak. What? Where are you getting this from, Bill? Again, the whole concept of a Jack O' Lantern comes from the story of Stingy Jack that came about already after Christianity was established in Ireland. In the form of their firstborn child, or their, their youngest child, I'm sorry. And um, so that's kind of, you know, the meaning of that. And now, of course, we just see it as a sign of, of you know, of, oh, this house is going along with the Halloween thing. You know, it actually has a much more sinister origin. And see, what people need to understand is that these symbols have a power all their own. I mean, you might say, well, it's just a pumpkin, for heaven's sakes. Well, yeah, it is just a pumpkin. But you see, in, in magic, in, in black magic, in the occult, there's this idea of, of thought forms and egregores. That's the word that's used from Greek. And it means basically something that, that, that gets power all of its own over the centuries. What? Bill, symbols don't take on energy and power all themselves and become like free-form living creatures that somehow manipulate things. Nobody looks at the Ford logo and the Ford logo does not come to life and then suddenly people start turning into trucks. Logos and images and symbols just don't work that way. Symbols represent something so that when you see a logo like Nike or Ford or whatever, you immediately associate that company with the symbol. That's the power of symbol. Over thousands and thousands of years of use, and it kind of demons and strong men come to inhabit it. So even if the person might put this pumpkin out and carve a face on it and whatnot and put a candle in it and think, oh, I'm just kind of being cute like the neighborhood is, you know, it still might very well draw demonic spirits. So that's why we should not, again, as it says in Jeremiah, learn the ways of the Gentiles. Exactly. Yes. And um, also bobbing for apples. I mean, a lot of people think it's just a bucket full of water, you know, uh, just a bunch of apples. But you want to explain the horrific origins where this comes from? Well, uh, the idea of it was is that originally they would actually take, you know, some of the leftover remains of the skulls of these children and use them as something to pull out of the water as kind of a, of a macabre game. And, uh, you know, so 
you know, again, there's some sort of meaning behind this, which, which we do not understand. And this is true of a lot of things. And then it comes to mind is the whole thing of witches on the bombing for apples comes from Pomona, who is the goddess of apples. It doesn't harken back to a day when, again, your sick, twisted imagination believes that they were doing something with babies and baby fat skulls. And I don't even, whatever you believe happened, didn't happen. It is not associated with that. It is associated with Pomona, who is the goddess of fertility. A broomstick. You see, uh, that actually goes back to the fact that in the Middle Ages, witches uh, would would literally take, see, the, the symbol of a high priestess's authority was her broomstick. <laughs> Bill, you need to go back. And whoever you studied Wicca with, whoever, if it was, if it was the Frosts or it was Alexander, Alexandrians in England or whoever it is that you studied Wicca under, you need to go back and take a refresher course because the broom or besom is not a symbol of the high priestess, which is called a besom. And she would, on certain nights of the year, when they were like planting crops or whatever, they would go out and they would jump around the field after they planted the crop on these broomsticks. And they believed that the high as they jumped, that's how high the crops were. So again, we're talking about sympathetic magic. Now, yes, that is sympathetic magic because it is the sympathy between the height of the jump and the height of the growth of the crops. So yes, there is evidence that Probably people, not necessarily witches, but definitely farmers and people who probably believed in the old ways, would get onto brooms and jump up in the air and try to go as high as they could, believing that if they got as high as they could, that the crops would grow that high. Yes, that was a form of sympathetic magic. So, good job, Bill. Good job. Good job. You got two right so far. Good job. Good job, Bill. What's called folk magic. And it was believed that, that as they did this, that it would make the ground more fertile and whatnot. And of course, some people that weren't witches were probably spying to see, ooh, what are these witches doing? And they saw them, you know, jumping around this field. And, oh, they're going to take off and they're going to fly. You know, just like, you know, s some birds take a while to get off the ground. Well, there's another side to that, too. And that is that, that witches would use what was called flying ointment. On nights like Halloween, they would take this ointment, which is made out of various hallucinogenic drugs. They'd rub it on their bodies, all over their bodies, and the ointment was supposedly to protect them from evil. <sighs> Flying ointments, they don't know exactly when they were used. They may have been used on Samhain. They may be used, been, had been used on Beltane. They may have been used for very specific rituals or very specific purposes. And again, we don't know. We have the recipe for it, but we don't know exactly what they used it for. If we look at the European witch cult to, and I am going to call it a witch cult, so people just understand that, uh, it could be shamanistic cult, it could be a druidic cult, it could be just sort of a combination of several different cultures that survived, but I'm just going to call it a witch cult for the ease, ease of use. But if we look at that and we compare it to other cultures who do use psychotropic drugs for visions or journeys or specific rituals, like let's say initiation rituals, or going to visit the dead, or going to speak with deities, or something like that. So the chances are that this European shaman cult, or witch cult, whatever you want to call it, probably did use this flying ointment as a way of traveling to the other world. But however they used it, if they used it at Samhain, or if they used it during initiation rituals, or if they used it during during specific rituals, 
We don't know exactly because, to the best of my knowledge, there's no record of it. If somebody has some information, they can leave it down below. But to the best of my knowledge, we don't know exactly when they used it. We have kind of an idea because it's called a flying ointment, but we don't know exactly when or why it was used. But what would happen instead is that that it would give them a trip, so to speak, like we would take acid nowadays. Well, these were like primitive hallucinogens, like belladonna, like aconite, and some other, other herbs that are hallucinogenic, but they're also poisonous. Yeah, Bill, almost all psychotropic drugs are poisonous. That's why they cause changes to occur in our physiology. And so once again, we have this association of pharmacaea, of, of using drugs and the occult and witchcraft. How are you taking all of these advancements in human civilization which have occult origins, occult origins in alchemy, occult origins in flying ointments and stuff like this, which led to pharmacology and understanding roots and herbs to heal? How are you taking this to be an evil thing? Do you think the vaccine for polio is an evil thing? Do you think aspirin is an evil drug? Do you think any advancements that we've made in pharmacology is evil? All over again. And that's why to have a cute little witch hanging from your porch or whatever, again, you're emulating things that are of the evil one. And also, uh, most people think Halloween is just one day. You want to describe how it's actually three days? I think it's the 29th, 30th, and 31st? Well, it's what in the occult it's called an orb. And it does. You're right. It does start up like on the day or so before it, and then it goes one day after it. And that's why, like, again, you see in the Roman church, you have... No, Bill, there is no orb in the occult. Chances are it probably either harkens back to a time when they were trying to match up the lunar cycle with the solar cycle because, as you are aware, the lunar cycle and the solar cycle don't match up. That's why we have a leap year every four years. So the concept of a missing day is behind the term a year and a day because the year does not exactly match up with the cycle of the moon. So there is a lost day that happens. So this is one possibility of why around this time that there was sort of one day that was kind of like a day that was not a day. So it could have been like a two-day celebration or a three-day celebration. But most likely, it also, because there were the ancient Roman festivals of honoring the dead, Lemire, honoring the saints, and also honoring just the general dead from the Celtic celebrations, chances are that's why we have three days. So that we have the evening before All Saints Day, which became All Hallows Eve, all Saints Day, and then November the 2nd, which became the Feast of the Dead, or honoring all saints and all martyrs and all people who died. November 1st, which is, of course, the day after Halloween is called All Saints Day, and November 2nd is called All Souls Day in their calendar, and that's because they're just trying to kind of piggyback on this ancient pagan feast that had already been around for probably thousands of years. So yeah, it actually starts a couple days earlier. And also, finally, um, you want to give a message to all Christians, especially pastors out there. Now, I've been to a lot of churches, and they say, oh, come come to Halloween, we're going to have a party. Come dress as an angel or biblical character. <clears throat> and do you want to give a good, strong message to these pastors and also anybody that's a Christian at that about not celebrating this thing at all? Take no part in this. Yeah, I would really strongly recommend that. I mean, you can do something on another night. But you don't want to really honor this night because it is the night when darkness, if, if I were a pastor, I would have people pray and fast on that night because believe me, the witches and the Satanists are praying and fasting before that to prepare to, to, to create all this cone of power, all this energy that's supposed to be raised on that night because they believe that this is the night that the doorways are open between the realms of the dead and the realms of the living and that spirits walk the earth. During each Sabbath, 
like I'm just going to say the main four ones, which is Samhain, M. Bulk, Beltane, and Lunasa. These four main ones are important feast and fire celebrations. This is a time that we recognize the changing of the seasons, especially Samhain. We recognize passing ancestors, but it is a celebration. It is a time of coming together and celebrating. There may be some ritual work that people may do, but it is more in line with communicating with our past ancestors, maybe a new beginning or letting go of something old. So it is a time of the year where we concentrate on letting go of the past and moving on with the future. The times that people who practice paganism and witchcraft today they have various times of the years where they may actually do rituals for whatever purpose it is. But there are not specific dates that we only do rituals. So to believe that around Samhain night is some kind of a big, huge ritual where everybody's trying to raise the Lord of the Dead or whatever is bullshit. It's your own figment of your imagination. Either you are completely insane and you think this, or you are just trying to spread this to disparage and make us look bad, where I actually believe the latter. And so, you know, you don't want that kind of energy going around in your community. And so if, if, if believers would take the time to pray and fast in and around Halloween for their children, for the protection of the children and the families and the churches and the community, that would be a much better way to use the time than to have a, a party where little kids get to dress up like angels. This is, this is one of the things that really kind of disturbs me about hardcore evangelists like this is you see, they have, they have to create an enemy. They basically have to find somebody to blame, a scapegoat, an enemy, or whatever. And so what they do is they create witches and pagans to be the enemy based upon their Bible, which has God and the anti-God, or the Savior and the anti-Savior, or whatever it is that they do. So they have to turn it into this dichotomy of these two things. And so they project all of this stuff onto us. And we don't care. We're just going through our lives doing whatever it is we do. We're celebrating Samhain. We're enjoying our time with our family and our friends, remembering and honoring our past ancestors. And that's what we're doing. We don't care. We're not, we're not trying to call up Satan or call up some kind of an anti-God or somehow cause havoc among Christians. We don't care. You are projecting all of this stuff onto us, Bill. We don't care. You are basically making us the enemy. And we're not your enemy. But you continually project onto us, saying that we're that we worship Satan or that we're worshiping Satan without knowing it or whatever it is. Our religion and our beliefs and our practices are completely separate and based on ancient, older practices. Either what we practice today based upon what we believe happened or trying to do reconstruction of what our ancestors practice. We don't care. This is all your projection onto us, Bill. So please stop projecting onto us. Absolutely. And, and when you uh, explain how they're fasting and praying, you know, the Satanists, is that the origins of Hell Knight? Because I believe uh, Hell Knight's the night before, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think in some in some uh, in some cities they even have really bizarre things that are done on the night before, and it's called Hell Night. But you know, the the point is, whatever the culture is, they still there's still these people that are very very dedicated. They're like dark, dark saints, if you will, and they will fast and pray to their gods for the destruction of the innocence of the youth, for the destruction of the morality of our young people. And we need to be just as diligent in getting on our knees and praying and fasting that our, our young people would stay pure, that our young people would not be defiled by the occult, and all these things. Big, big challenge for us, and we need to rise to the challenge. Again, Bill, this is your projection onto us. 
we don't give a flying fuck what you do. So you believe that we're spending all this time and energy on trying to do these evil, horrible things in a world where we're not. Everything that we, doing during, we do during a ritual, you would probably find really boring and actually rather pedestrian. It means it has a lot of meaning to us because we're doing it and we understand it. But to an outsider, it would just look like weird practices and just be kind of boring and dull. And that is, we're not doing anything. We're not, there's no baby sacrifices. We're not drinking blood. We're not having crazy wild orgies. We're not praying to some kind of a dark God. That is not what we're doing. If anything, we're doing stuff that is already similar to celebrations that they do around Halloween. We're, do, we're bobbing for apples. We're having feasts. We're enjoying people's company. We're feasts. We're having, we're honoring the dead. We're honoring the deceased. That's what we do around Samhain. We actually have a lot of fun. That's it. All right, great, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. I know you wanted to talk about Mitt Romney during our interview, during the Money Bomb, but you know, due to uh, overwhelming phone calls, we had to take the calls and all that. But, um... All right, but this is the end of this video. They just go on talking about the Illuminati and the Freemasons and Mitt Romney and Mormonism, whatever other crazy-ass shit they're into. So this is the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much. And have a wonderful Samhain. Blessed be.